right, it's generated, so it should be starting. There's about a 10 to 20 second delay. Can you see my screen? What's happened to it? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> Right, ready, guys? Yep. Jen? <laughs> Shall I start now? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first Jog Chat Live. We're hoping this is going to go smoothly, and I won't talk very long because we're very tight on time but I'd like to say a big thank you to all our speakers first of all and we hope that you have a lovely good a lovely good a good hour of CPG so we'll start straight away and our keynote speaker is Katie on making a spiral curriculum that actually spirals thanks Jen right just share my screen Okay, can we all see that? Yes, we good? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I thank you first, first of all, thank you so much to, to Jen and to Paul for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to be the keynote speaker for this. Um, it's such an exciting opportunity for everybody and such a great thing to be part of, so thank you. Um, right, so my focus today is going to be on making a spiral curriculum that actually spirals or does it, uh, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so as you can see here, th these are loads of examples of spirals or what's otherwise known in maths as the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and the idea of this is that this exists in several places in nature, uh, as you can see. So for example, plants can grow new cells in spirals like the sunflower that you can see there. Um, and this sp spiral happens sort of naturally uh, because each new cell is formed after each turn. Um, but how does this link to curriculum? Well, the idea of adding to knowledge in that sort of cyclical way, I think is really intriguing. Um, and I've also been doing a bit of work this year at, at uh, the Fawcett Fellowship as part of a UCL course, um, which has helped me to really sort of think in depth about curriculum. So hopefully by the end of this talk, that'll all make sense how that kind of all links together. Um, so I'll sort of be briefly outlining some reading that I've done about spiral curricula and then uh, sort of outlining my schools and, and sort of my current position in terms of our curriculum and how we've helped it to spiral or do something slightly different, as you'll see. So. Where does the concept of a spiral curriculum come from? Now, I did a, a poll on Twitter about uh, three or four days ago and almost half of all people who answered, and I think I just did it for three hours and there were about 150 people, um, and over half of those said that they had never heard of it. So this is a sort of cognitive theory that was put forward by uh, Bruner. Um, and the idea is that over, you know, it might be over a three year, key stage three curriculum or your entire seven year curriculum, you would revisit topics at, at, at increasing levels of difficulty. Um, and the idea is that new skills and new notions are clearly related to the previous learning, but you, beget, you become more competent and it becomes more difficult. Now, we do this anyway within uh, geography because obviously we might introduce a concept to Key Stage 3 that we, re, we, we revisit in more detail at Key Stage 4 and then Key Stage 5. Um, however, I'm kind of looking at this in the concept of uh, Key Stage 3 curriculum and whether we could apply that there. Now, who is in favor of this? Well, Robinson said that by spiraling around, we return, but when, when returning, we build upon previous knowledge and we expand the pupil's repertoire. So if you look at uh, the forgetting curve on the right here, the, the obvious advantage of this is that the more that they revisit an idea, the less likely they are to forget it. So that's an obvious benefit. Um, and I like this concept, which is that it would be rid ridiculous to teach painting all at once and never return to it. And applying that to geography, I, I thought about the concept of mapping and how many of us start year seven by introducing maps. Uh, but does we teach maps in term one, year seven, does that really cut it? Uh, that's something that I want to explore and kind of uh, challenge a bit further. But there are some critics of this idea. Um, and 
I think this is something that we need to be careful of if we're going to apply this concept of a spiral curriculum, which is that unless you design it imaginatively, uh, content structures that are built around recurrent elements, uh, whether those are ideas or themes, are vulnerable to repetition. And I tweeted earlier this year about the fact that I couldn't stand teaching coasts three times in a row. Uh, from key stage three key, GCSE and A level and by the end of A level the children that had been all the way through our school said they were bored of it but I think that was our problem we had not uh, structured that curriculum properly we hadn't made it interesting and varied enough um, but I think it is worth pointing out that that is a risk so we, we've got to be aware of that um, and this idea that the implementation of any curricular program displays some sort of sequence but whether that sequence supports the process of learning or is just a matter of organizational convenience varies greatly and I, I do think historically and I do think the geography com uh, community is getting a lot better at this lately uh, but I think historically it, across all subjects not just geography there has been a case of we'll do tectonics just before they pick their GCSE options um, because it's interesting and fun so we need to think about that sequence a little bit more so what alternatives are there? Um, well, there's something called the Strand Curriculum, uh, which Daisy Christodoulou made me aware of earlier this year when she, she tweeted about it. Um, and this is the idea that each lesson is organised around skills or topics rather than a sim single skill or topic. Um, so, and I'm not sure about this second part, but where it says each skill or topic is only addressed for five to ten minutes in any given lesson, uh, but it's been revisited day after day for many lessons. So an example of that might be uh, the, the concept of teaching about uh, climate graphs. You might actually, across um, a sort of series of different topics, bring climate graphs back in, um, and so it's a strand rather than a spiral, and it looks a little bit like this. Now, um, Chris Dulu says a strand is a better metaphor for a curriculum than a spiral. And just take a look uh, a moment to look at that figure and see what she sort of means by that. Now, looking at this got me on to thinking about the idea of sort of blocks um, and whether we should teach through blocks. Um, and so I did a bit more reading about this and there are lots of, there's lots out there on blocks and interleaving and people are quite passionate about this one way or the other. So if you look at the top right diagram, this is sort of showing that there's, if you block, then you do, you know, term half, first half term topic one, second half term topic two, etc. cetera. Um, but with interleaving, you sort of, you go back to and you revisit those ideas. Now, TID came up with the sort of second two lines, second diagrams, um, this idea that actually that interleaving um, could be a little bit more sporadic, but you are still blocking. So it's kind of a combination of the two. So it incorporates elements from a previous unit, but you still have a block. And I quite like that concept. I think we probably all do that more than we realise. Uh, but he also says the spiral curriculum alone is not enough. So teaching based on assessment alone um, won't, won't work. We need really well structured and sensibly sequenced practice filled curriculum as our basic starting point. And just final, finally on to sort of the idea of uh, literature, I think, uh, if, I, if I haven't already said, I think the thing that I got out of this and that I've got out of this sort of course over the last year is that sequencing is key. So we have to build each lesson on the previous one and it has to be clear how they, they, those are then sequenced and why they're sequenced that way. And that we then do frequently review and recall that information from previous topics, uh, but that, that we're still moving forward. Um, now, one way of doing this is that to put a common thread that links sort of different topics or books together. Um, and uh, Chris Dulu gives the example of history and says that's pretty easy to do with chronological structure, but that you could actually add in other links. So, for example, you could have themes, say culture, society, technology, military and politics, and see how those are sort of woven throughout history. Um, now, I think that that's really easy to do in geography. Uh, it's just that we might not agree on what those themes are. And I'm going to show you in a minute how I introduce those themes into my curriculum. Um, and this sort of led me on to thinking about uh, Mary Myatt's point of view, which is that if we perhaps reduce it down to only five or six themes a year, rather than perhaps trying to do um, lots and lots of topics and cram them all in, it makes it more meaningful for children because we can sort of go deeper into what we're studying. Um, and we can really do that in depth rather than racing through a pile of irrelevant material. Finally, um, Mark Enster said, uh, perhaps we're getting a bit confused with the idea of interleaving and interweaving. Um, so perhaps this idea of uh, making sure that we interweave, so identifying themes as I'm about to show you, rather than just uh, sort of jumping between topics. Um, and this is sort of 
where we can introduce genuine interleaving. So we might, uh, when we teach volcanic eruptions, he says, for example, um, you know, look at the impacts of two different volcanic eruptions. Um, and that would be sort of genuine interleaving. That would be a good opportunity to do that. But we're not trying to make interleaving a planning tool because it is the wrong tool for that job. So how uh, did I sort of put this all together? Well, this was my curriculum three years ago. Um, and I liked this idea of coming up with these five worlds. So those are my themes, those are my concepts. Um, and the idea was that we would, as, as the spiral goes round, sort of introduce uh, a new topic which fits into each of those worlds. Now, even though that looked really pretty and we gave it to all the students and the topics were interesting, I'll be honest with you, we didn't really exploit those themes very well. Um, but I have had an opportunity when I'm moving into my new school, starting in September, to have a look at the curriculum again. Um, and I've, I've kind of adapted that and I'll show you that uh, in a moment. Um, but I just want to point out, I think we've been calling this the wrong thing the whole time because a spiral emanates out from one point uh, and a helix is a corkscrew shape. And all of the examples that I've looked at um, are helix shaped. And I think that's important because with themes and with concepts, as you can see in the top right hand uh, diagram, the idea of the themes being threaded through, you couldn't do that with a spiral. You would have, you would have to have that helix shape. So I'm going to change it. I'm not going to call it a spiral curriculum. I'm going to call it a helix curriculum. Um, so. Here is what I've come up with. This is what my, my newest curriculum at the moment looks like. It's still a work in progress. So any feedback is, uh, I'd be grateful for. Um, but as you can see here, I thought really clearly about what I wanted my five helix themes to be. And you can see those on the right hand side, place, environments, interrelationships, boundaries, and UK investigation. And I'm gonna make those super explicit so that we come back to them and we re revisit those every single year and we can get all the benefits that were uh, discussed earlier. Now that, I hope uh, has been clear. If you've got any questions, I'd love to answer them. But just to finish off, um, here are my questions moving forward or things that I'd love to discuss um, on Twitter. So what are your Helix themes? Do you think that connecting concepts that you can see with the arrows here are useful? Do you think this is user friendly and, and could we and should we share this with students? Um, and does this model strike a balance between, and I can't see what's underneath that, but there we go. <laughs> that's it. Um, uh, that's everything. That's that's my presentation. Those are my references. Thank you so much for listening. Fab, thank you very much, Katie. Um, we will move swiftly on to Mr. Viz. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, right, let's share the presentation. So uh, there we go. Evening everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about the importance of literature in developing a coherent curriculum. And I think the first thing we have to start with is accepting the fact that across the world, geography is, very, is often seen as a binary subject with human concepts and physical concepts usually very distinct from one another. One another. So uh, from where I come from in France, uh, physical geography is actually taught in uh, SVT, which is dead biology, and human geography is actually taught in Histoire which is an equivalent of humanities. And um, that's, that causes an issue with our subject. And even in the UK itself, um, we have a course at GCSE where you've got paper one physical, paper two human, same again at A-level. And then when the students go on to um, university, they actually have to pick one or the other. Um, and I think our job as uh, geography teachers is to make sure we bridge that geography divide in essence and show students how physical processes and human actions actually work together to create the world in which we live in. So I've used my time during lockdown to do some research around that. And three of the most valuable resources I came across were Kate Stockings' uh, CPD set with Seneca on developing a coherent curriculum. Um, Richard Kennick, who despite being a historian, does really good stuff on a coherent curriculum within the trust I work in. And then Mason Davies' blog on um, fixing the COVID crevasses uh, after the lockdown. Um, and in all of these um, CPDs, the authors talk about meta concepts, they talk about mega concepts, about uh, core concepts or key concepts, and they see those concepts as, as sitting above the substantive material of the schemes of work. And those concepts highlight the core knowledge our geographers need to know in order to become better geographers. So in light of all this, I thought, you know what, um, I've just been appointed uh, head of geography in my school for September. It's probably time I review my curriculum and review uh, what I've been doing. So I looked back through our curriculum and I thought, well, let's get started. What are the core concepts in my curriculum to, key, uh, to tie everything in? Um, and that's when it actually hit me that um, 
that can't be done even with the best intentions if you don't have an up-to-date subject knowledge especially for teachers like me uh, who are in the start of their careers i mean only in my third year um and without the up-to-date subject knowledge that becomes very much impossible and you might even start creating misconceptions and so having done lots of reading around the subject some of the key um books i read were or typically behind my camera, but Origins from uh, Lewis Dartnell and The New Silk Road by uh, Peter Frankopan, along with uh, The Economist magazine or The Geographical magazine. Um, and all those helped help me see synoptic links between key geogra geographical themes we need students to learn. And if you want to find out more about the notes I've made, you can find them all on the Early Careers Geography Network Google Drive. Um, and you can also find uh, me on Google, uh, Google Read, Goodreads if you want to. Um, but they help me to see what's the core geography knowledge we need to know and we need to pass on to students. Um, so with that in mind, I then turn my attention to um, some of the details of these books. So for example, um, the origins from uh, Lewis Dartnell, one of the quotes in the book says that the Himalaya and Tibetan plateau we know of creates a monsoon system. And this has a sucking effect whereby all the moisture over, over East Asia is actually drawn out of East, uh, East Africa, sorry, not East Asia, and it reduces rainfall. So as a result of that, the, bio, the habitats in the forest uh, actually uh, get fragmented and destroyed and get replaced by savannah. And he claims that that's one of the biggest reasons behind the evolution of our species as we had to move out of that uh, of that ecosystem. And again, you've got another crazy fact here, or what I found crazy, was that the, uh, if you look at a map of tectonic uh, plates and you look at where the major cities in the world are, you notice that there's a strong, strong correlation. And you think this is insane. Why on earth would people want to live on, on the plate boundary? Actually, the reason behind that is because on plate boundaries, you've got really good water springs and water sources. And then suddenly, it, you suddenly realize that you've got your global atmospheric circulation model, you've got your tectonics, you've got your resources, you've got your rivers, you've got your development topics of the spec and geography, which tie in beautifully together. And we need to try and highlight that to the students. And it's the same again here with the New Silk Road uh, by Peter Frankopan. One of the facts he claims that in 2001, China's GDP was 39% that of the US on the purchasing power parity. And by 2016, it went up to 114%. Again, great links to superpowers, development, economic geography. And another shocking fact here was that 70% of developmental problems in Central Asia is actually caused by freshwater shortages. And that's gonna be made worse by the fact that one of their biggest glaciers is gonna shrink by 80% over the next three decades, linking topics like climate change, resources, um, rivers and, um, and development. And so with all this knowledge of the reading and the CPD I did, I decided to have a look at our own curriculum, our own schemes of work and try and come up with concepts which tie in those key geographical themes and topics together in the hope of making better geographers and so in doing that I came up with this list here um, which you can see on the screen for our key stage three curriculum from year seven to year nine and that can be that will be done later on with the key stage four and five but what I really learned through that process is that the curriculum doesn't change overnight it shouldn't actually change overnight it's a takes time it's a process which you have to do meticulously in order to achieve success and I hope this short presentation has given you a good idea of the journey I've gone through uh, in order to develop my own curriculum and if you've got any kind of questions or you want to know a bit more about what I did please don't hesitate to contact me on Twitter or Instagram with uh, the at Mr. Viss Geography um, but it's kind of just to show you that the step of literature is key, key, key in order for us to be able to create a strong, coherent curriculum. Otherwise, we might get too eager and carried away. But on that note, I'll send it back to uh, Jenna or Jenna, Jen. There we go. Thank you very much. OK, moving swiftly on to David Rogers now. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so hopefully you can see that all right. Uh, and first of all, thank you for, for choosing um, this talk. And also thank you for um, sending those, uh, what I should cover on Twitter. So I'll do the best I can. Um, you can access um, this presentation at any time, um, bit.ly forward slash um, NEA right if you want to. Um, and essentially uh, this is about um, how uh, I think um, we can get the NEA right um, by telling the story of, of what I've been 
doing. Um, like others, um, I, I know Enza's out there watching, so I thought I'd whack in some, uh, some research. So there it is. Um, and there is some underlying principles, and this goes in in terms of the curriculum. And the most important thing for me is um, the high quality geography versus the compliance. Now, um, I spent two years teaching actually remotely, um, A level and so on, and, and honed sort of this NEA process then. Um, but also, I'm a great believer in that it isn't um, just for A level, um, and this is really important. Um, and what we can control. Um, is what happens in our classrooms and what happens in our curriculum and developing great geographers. What we can't control is whatever whims happen on exam boards and what fieldwork's gonna look like, but good quality geography equals great fieldwork and great fieldwork investigation. So that's where we should focus and then we can twist that um, to everything else. Um, if you can hear some squeaking, it's just uh, my dog playing with a toy so um and and so being a geographer is very simple but it's also complex uh, and really um as my other half is um a primary teacher you know this is a 13 year journey and so even if you're 11 to 16 um you're really responsible for developing great quality geographical field work that helps on the nea and, and that's really important it kind of feels in feeds into sort of katie's um talk in terms of um thinking really carefully about that curriculum and where we go from it because what we're looking for is young people that critically evaluate research and critically evaluate the world so for example um you know this quote is widely attributed to c.s lewis however um he never wrote it um and you can just do an instant net search i thought oh you know that's a nice thing i can chuck it in it links to my presentation i better look at the um you know the 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 founding of this uh, and actually um, it's it seems to be false um, but I do believe in what it says um, and if we're in the situation where we're, we're at further education college we're starting in year 12 um, or you know we, we really only think about the NEA when it gets to year 12 or maybe in the summer term then we can still do something about it a better model I suggest is that we do that high quality right the way from um, year one and when I was a head of geography which which feels many many moons ago um, we really underpinned and, and hung everything off the inquiry model um, and looking at that curriculum recently um, I would still use that approach even though the curriculum has changed twice since then and the exam board regulations have changed you know from control assessment to uh, a fieldwork paper um, it's changed um, a level from as uh, and a2 to a level etc but i would still um, follow and develop this model right the way from lesson one of year seven in terms of we're doing fieldwork and we're going to be geographers great fieldwork is about observing um, and collecting uh, and analysing. However, you need that geographical knowledge, which has already been covered really well. But without that geographical knowledge, you can't just go out and look at a nice view and understand the geography without first being taught the geography going out. And then that great skill of reading the landscape comes from really strong geographical knowledge. And I, I'll never forget the, um, you know, my university um, lecturer, we jumped out in Cardigan. Um, he's starting to read the landscape. It's a treeless um, landscape, he was saying. But behind him was was one of the biggest forests um, that are in southwest Wales so uh, it's about using our eyes but also that knowledge um, and I thought I'd better just then share um, because I believe that's the, that's the approach however how do I sort of go about it as I said so the long term it's there it's that expert inquirers masters of field work it's about getting to grips with big data sets GIS and stats right the way from year seven um, and actually if you whack in a big stats through a GIS and show it some year sevens the patterns and the geographical patterns are brilliant as I said to my year 12s last week if, if they just go out and collect five data points um, they're going to make life really difficult for themselves um, and it's about the factfulness rule of thumb which I'll flash up in a little while um, and then in the sixth form it's about starting with that NEA straight away to be talking about it right the way from the off it's about making sure that the first two units which for us are place and um, coast have bits of the NEA through it so we're dropping in that further reading um, and and it's used factfulness all the way through uh, in the current sort of um, 
new normal or however what we want to call it we're automatically attracted to the big shiny stuff the biggest research whatever has been been told but actually you know um it's important that we develop this um this approach not through a factfulness scheme of work but actually threading this through the whole curriculum in terms of you know are we critical um consumers um of of data so have a look at those how am i doing um and then finally i'll just go on to year 12 um, and when you look at the presentation online you'll be able to see then what i've actually taught um and so you know we, we're hitting it straight away we go to um to, to London um, in the spring, usually um, for the residential. Of course, the elephant in the room, what are we going to do? It's like at the moment, hold fire until we've got some information. And then I've got confidence in that, you know, as expert geographers, we will get our young people um, through. I go away for a three day res residential as soon as possible. Um, I don't do that because I'm, um, you know, on SLT. I do that because I'm pig headed and it's good quality geography and it's the right thing to do um, and then usually in the summer we do a Brighton pilot test study which hasn't happened at the moment my year 12s are working on their secondary data analysis and their method um, and what I would say is that it's breaking each section down and so for this if they do nothing else write the way just get them to read 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 and then write a literature review that's a hundred words long they find it really hard but then they develop really good quality high level geography so there is no short answer to a quality nea it's about absolute high quality geography all the time from lesson one from your institution and if you don't have a sixth form it's about doing that because you're going to help that young person become a great geographer in the future rather than pass those exams so if you want to know more look at the presentation do get in touch i've got all the stuff that we use i'm, I'm actually teaching year 12 tomorrow which i'm mega excited about and i hope you enjoy the rest of the talks thank you david um, moving swiftly on to Rachel and Tina. Hey, sorry, I'll just get my PowerPoint ready. Um, which one is it? There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Fab. Okay. Um, hi, so we're going to be talking about decolonizing geography. Um, and I'll let Hina introduce herself later. Um, but I think it's important we're talking about decolonizing geography rather than the geography curriculum. Um, it's not just about adding some lessons here and there. It needs to be about kind of our attitudes, teachers attitudes, representation and a lot more. Um, so I'm going to try and get through this as quick as I can. If I skip over stuff, it's not because it's not important. All of it's really important, but I'm just wary of time. Um, but the first thing I was going to talk about is going back to the theme of the GA conference. Why does geography matter? Um, and think about it in the context of decolonizing geography. So Steve Brace put out this before he did his talk about why geography really matters. Um, and without fail, lots of people were talking about complexity. They were also talking about global issues, recognizing uh, the place they have and understanding the places where they live. And I think currently, not all the time, but some of some things are missing in our geography curriculum and in our subject that means students can't fully understand or don't have the tools to kind of recognize the real complexities. Um, so on the theme of RGS, I just wanted to show you this for two reasons, and there's so much text on the screen, so don't worry about reading it, but you can use the link to get there. Um, but RGS put this out as a statement on Black Lives Matter, and I think it's really important that we recognise, like they have, um, that it, by definition, geography is deep rooted in colonialism whether that is the fact that geographers were used for imperialism, if we think about the fact they needed cartographers, people who knew about human settlements and things like that, but also that geographers kind of benefited from imperialism because they were able to collect data and other things. So there is a big legacy of geography deep rooted in colonialism. And I think it's about us acknowledging that and dealing with that legacy to move forward. Um, so, 
in terms of that, I think this kind of shook the geography community at the end of last year, uh, when Danny Dawling had written an article and journalists kind of jumped on it and turned it into geography being a soft option for posh students. Um, but actually, he, you know, it opened up quite a good discussion and debate about these issues. And he again went back to it being a subject of imperial domination. And he talked about, you know, we need to address this and deal with that legacy. So also last week, just on this, he there was a report or an article in The Guardian about BAME uh, students, and actually there's been no black students on a geography course in Oxford for the last three years. So the answer to that, has geography got a diversity problem, is perhaps yes. Um, I'm just going to show you one more thing on this. So the, I, I love this book and I've used it for planning and I found it really useful. So I was really disappointed when I came across this in the Hodder uh, Key Stage 3 progress. So here we have a geographer's view of the future for the planet and as you can see without fail they are all male they are predominantly white um, and we've got Donald Trump as a geographer which I find very problematic um, I have found out that David Gardner is going to fix this in the next issue but the fact that that's there in the first place that's how students are perceiving geographers is very very problematic to me um, so one thing I think is really important is increasing representation so with that, making sure our students are represented in the lesson. So questions to ask yourself, how are students represented? What do geographers look like in the textbooks you use? If you have to use textbooks, how can you critique that? Um, and then also kind of display. So I've shared these on Twitter, free to take them, but making sure that students can identify with geographers. Um, so I'm now gonna pass you to Hina and then she can introduce herself and stuff. Hello, um, I'm Hina. We've got the same surname just by pure chance. Um, I've been a geographer for 20 plus years. I am East African Asian in my ethnic background, but I was born in the UK myself. So growing up doing geography, I chose to do geography um, because I had an amazing teacher who really got me into the subject. But there were very, very few people from different ethnic backgrounds doing geography. University, exactly the same thing. It's not just about the issues with we don't feel comfortable from different backgrounds doing geography um, because of the way we are treated within the subject. It's also to do with the fact that it's not seen as a subject that can lead you somewhere. It's not being a doctor or an accountant or something that's going to make a lot of money and actually have a career path. And um, when I chose to be a teacher, it was like, oh, great, you're going to get lots of holidays. Isn't that fab when you become a mum? Obviously, it's not like that. So within our subject and teaching it, we need to ensure that we're encouraging students from all kinds of backgrounds with parents that may be thinking those kind of views to understand the importance of what we do and why we do it. One of the key things to start with is addressing the misconceptions and stereotypes um, within our subject in the way that we teach things, but also the way that students view things. Those misconceptions and stereotypes quite often come from parents. They're not just from the children themselves. You've got to be careful how you address this. Um, but really importantly, you have to address them, not just brush them under the carpet. They don't exist. You know, if children are thinking that migrants come to the UK and take everyone's jobs, you need to make sure they understand why people think that is the case before you break that down. And migration is one of those big issues where we quite often, you know, all the old case studies from the textbooks used to be Mexico into the USA. But what about everybody coming into the UK over time? Uh, there's really good clips on looking at backgrounds of people and ethnicities and actually people who think they're pure white British and what's come into the where they're actually from is very, very different. Uh, but they don't know about it because it's so far into their past. So it's ensuring that we do cover those misconceptions um, and things like Dollar Street, um, Gapminder are absolutely fabulous in showing students countries and parts of countries that they don't know about. So I really want to make sure that as geography teachers, we are making sure we are updating our subject knowledge. We are ensuring that we're not just teaching whole country information. We're teaching about areas. We're making sure that students know within countries they've not been to, that urban areas are different to the rural areas. If you talk about water security, it's not necessarily going to apply to the whole country. It's very specific to parts of the country and to ensure that we are making those students globally aware, but also not trying to take people down because of the way that they think. Um, Rachel goes up, talks a little bit more about this in a moment, and I'm very aware of time, so I'm gonna move back to Rachel. 
Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm really aware of time. It's going to try and get through as much as I can. I'm going to share the PowerPoint and a blog post on this tomorrow. So if I'm really speedy, I'm sorry. Um, but just on terms of kind of this, how we do this, I think it's really important. It's embedded in what we already do. This isn't bolt on. It needs to be embedded and blended. So an example, um, a classic example of an earthquake we often study is history. Uh, sorry, Haiti. Yes, Haiti's poor, so it was worse. But actually, we go into detail and we think about, well, why is Haiti in poverty? What has led it to get there? Um, so we talk about the only successful slave rebellion there's ever been that happened in Haiti, which then resulted in trade embargoes, um, which meant they were blocked from exporting. And that's had a legacy in the country. So we're unpicking this and decolonizing uh, that specific bit. Again, linking back to um, breaking down stereotypes, the danger of a single story is really important. Important, um, and that video is excellent. Um, alternative perspectives. So the idea that you know we lots of us teach about uh, SDGs, MDGs, but do we actually critique that? Because it is a Western view of development. It's neoliberal, um, and some people argue that it's a case of neo-colonialism. So again, the article linked here talks about whether the MDGs were actually a good idea. Were they a good measure um, for places in Africa? As well as that, on the note of neo-colonialism, so not only thinking about old colonialism, but new colonialism as well. So these maps on the right, the, what, the top one is an old colonial map, the bottom one is about mining companies, and you can see a similar pattern there. Again, places like the IMF and structural adjustment policies, are these just a new way of power or exerting power and influence over these countries? Uh, maps this top right video is brilliant it's from the west wing um, but it talks about kind of how maps and the macarta projection basically imbalances the power they've shrunk africa and it it was for navigation purposes but now um, we don't use it for navigation purposes so why are we still using those maps in our classrooms um, as well as that the bottom left if you show this map to students, it blows their mind, but it's actually just a map of the world. So decentering Europe, um, and it also helps with geographical knowledge and location knowledge too. Um, really, really, and most importantly, I think this needs to be a collaborative approach. So working not only within humanities, but across the school. Um, and this organization here, One Bristol Curriculum, obviously it's based in Bristol, um, but they're doing some amazing work about thinking about this being across the school and not just up to individual teachers. So check out their YouTube um, and that, that website because it's really fantastic. Um, and I think most importantly, it's about continuing our own learning journey. I think some people find this a difficult conversation to have. Um, I've heard some teachers say it's too emotional to raise in the classroom. And I think it's that's really giving our students a disservice. Um, Miss Rosh Jog, I think that's all her, she's shared some resources for people who'd like to broaden their understanding and it's an absolutely fantastic resource. Um, and I think it's about giving ourselves agency and empowering ourselves to have these conversations. Yes, it's gonna be uncomfortable in some, uh, in some times and learning and growing is gonna be uncomfortable for us, but we need to address this um, for our students basically. Um, last few things, join the conversation. On the left are two student led campaigns that are amazing. Uh, fill in the blanks basically took over loads of metro newspapers and uh, like restapled them and put out thousands across central London, um, basically saying that these fake headlines about Boris bringing back the empire into education, which was really great. Um, and I'm also part of a network for, of teachers from primary to university that are working on this so if you want to get involved get in top contact and I'm just going to leave you with this quote which is from Akira Williams who's part of this campaign this is the start of a very long journey it's not going to happen overnight but I think we do need to start these conversations and maintain momentum and that and as she says our classrooms are just that and that is everything and I'm sorry it took some time thanks <laughs> Moving, thanks for that, guys. Uh, moving on to Ryan. All right, Christ. Um, following that, eh? Jeez. Uh, so, my talk is going to be mainly something that you could probably kind of start putting in, uh, in place. I've actually been doing this uh, for a couple of years now, um, and then 
that obviously during lockdown, this has become uh, absolutely crucial in terms of uh, sort of keeping our year 12s um, up to date with everything. Uh, so I'm going to just talk you through kind of like the the process of using Google Slides, Google Docs, um, and, it, and what it has done. It's kind of improved our collaboration, uh, and then I've started introducing debate to it. Uh, so it's fairly simple to set up. So I'll, I'll talk through it, and I'll, I'll go through it, uh, bits and bobs in it. Um, so you don't need uh, a Gmail account. You can go through it through your school email, uh, and it's kind of how I've got through it with safeguarding guidelines. Uh, because all the students within our school um, have got their own uh, email address as well and it can link into their to a gmail account uh, and it actually start, I was started encouraging them to use their g drives as well to back up work because obviously we've had issues in the past with neas and uh, other things getting lost um, and ultimately uh, once you set that up and you've got your um, sort of email link to it it's fairly simple to set up um, so when you go into your g drive um, i'm not going to go through it like two, I'm going to go quickly. Uh, so you go into your blank presentation, go into Google Slides. Um, so fairly simple. And it pretty much operates like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so you get this list on your uh, sort of G drive to see what you've set up. So you can see I've set up four separate ones there just for, for lockdown. Uh, and you can see that all different topics that we'll study. Um, and then ultimately, um, when you set it up, which I'll show you what it looks like, uh, there's a share button in the top right hand corner you type in their emails uh, put them in and obviously just make sure that they're editors so they can change and adjust the slides um, and then they just end up looking like this so this is just the human geography we do uh, with in one of the years uh, so like i said it's all set up like a, a powerpoint presentation similar controls uh, text box things like that they're all just sort of laid out slightly differently um, so what i've done is sort of color coded um, each section. So each of the slides for one um, topic that we do is color coded. Um, and then when they log in, all the students get a color assigned to them. Uh, and that color stays with them for, for their entirety when they log in. So you can see there are three students at the top that have signed into this PowerPoint that are sharing this one. Um, and everything they do, which I'll show you in a little bit, um, it gets assigned to them. Um, and ultimately, um, we just go through at the beginning, going through sort of like rules to put in there. Um, so the idea is that it's a mixture between content and exam question pages. Uh, we'll put the link to the specification in there in case they needed it. Uh, and then just to remind them that, I, and I'll talk you through this in a minute about what kind of things to do uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. So once it's set up, uh, you can just sort of watch them go. Um, so to structure it, all I've done is each different slide has got a particular topic. Um, based in the in the scheme of work that we've got and then in red um, just a few questions for them to look at and to answer uh, so that they know kind of roughly what they're putting in and then at the bottom of each slide there's a little section there for them to encourage them for uh, sort of like further reading with website links or perhaps video links to documentaries or things that they can find uh, and then in the bottom right hand corner they have to claim uh, who owns that slide so in other words, if, if one of the three logs in and they want to do that, they can see that that person has claimed that slide as we try and get them only to claim one slide at a time. Um, so once it's set up and shared, you can sit back and watch them go. Um, so ultimately, um, they can you can see them type in the in live and you can watch them uh, from afar. Um, and I've done this in school and outside of school, obviously during lockdown uh, when we've had our lessons. Um, and there's even a little history bar on this, so you can, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so there's, you can even watch that they're not copying and pasting anything and uh, watch what they're typing. And you can actually live mark if you're like, within lockdown, we've been doing it quite a lot. So the history bar looks like this. Um, so you can see that each of them on the right hand side has got their own color. Even I've got my own color as I logged in. Uh, but it, it tells you kind of when they logged in, what time they logged in. Um, and then you, you, it's hard to see on this one, but each little section that they've done has got like a bow, a border around it. So you can see that this one is a sort of lighter blue border or like a greeny blue border. So the top person in this was editing this at the time. So I can click on each one of those separate uh, sort of times and it will take me back to a previous version as well. So if anybody accidentally deletes something, you can open up a previous version, copy it, and then obviously paste it onto the most current one. Um, 
what I've also started to include is some feedback. So obviously to make sure there's a feedback loop, make sure I'm quality assuring it. Um, as we go through, we can add additional comments to it. So the idea is they're basically threefold things. So checking understanding of the key concept topics that they do, tackling and, and, and identifying any misconceptions and challenging on those. Um, and then if there aren't any of those, just to try and stretch and challenge their thinking. Uh, so for example, um, throughout the sections, uh, I've got them to like put in little boxes um, where they can obviously look at a question, answer that question. Um, like in school, our, our feedback policy is to mark in green and they respond in red. So we've kept it fairly consistent. Um, and then there is a chat function on it as well. Um, so at the beginning, the chat function that was used to kind of a, like a check in and they would ask questions or uh, if they needed to ask for help and things like that. But I've started to sort of develop it into a, a little bit more uh, discussion based uh, and either um, discussing sort of specific topics that we've been doing and, and looking at specific slides, which I'll show you in a minute, or current affairs things. And actually, it's been quite good recently uh, to get them to start thinking about the links between uh, sort of globalization and the coronavirus and then other things that have come up. Uh, and then obviously some synoptic tools as well. Uh, so the chat function, when you open it, um, comes up in the right hand side. So this one, I just decided that we would start talking about soft and hard power, uh, looking at what their sort of thoughts and opinions were on those. Uh, so you start them off with a concept or a statement to discuss. Uh, but what I would suggest is that you start um, kind of telling them when to reply, because some of them were typing some really long replies in. And obviously, by the time somebody had pressed enter, the reply was kind of like over, overshadowed it. So uh, one at a time, I was getting them to write their responses. Um, and then it just kind of builds in. So you can see that they, these are like uh, the first two on the left uh, are just them having a discussion with each other, and me uh, sort of prompting them and asking them questions. Um, and then the one on the right uh, is about obviously a different one. So climate change causing the next major migration movement uh, and getting them to think again, sort of like outside the box, linking it in. And you can see right at the bottom, I questioned his. Uh, or that person, not his, shouldn't have said his, but it is him. Uh, so that person's idea that um, it wasn't existing, or it was not as bad as it sounds, and getting them to start reading through. Um, so obviously reacting, responding to any misconceptions or generalizations. And it's one of the big things we found with our uh, sick formers is that they generalize uh, quite often, especially the weaker ones that we've had put in. Uh, but what I've started doing as well with it is starting assessing during lockdown. I know assessment has been coming up in our school quite a lot about whether we should do it or shouldn't do it um, and, and what kind of basis that has. Uh, but ultimately, it doesn't have to be during lockdown. It, we, we can put it in place at all times. Um, but I've set up sort of exam style questions in the slides, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then I've set a live assessment, uh, which uh, our, one of or our group did yesterday. Uh, so the questions within it look like this. So ultimately, um, at regular intervals throughout, so you can see on the left hand side, it comes in slide number 10 and number 13, just giving them some examples of questions for them to answer. Again, one person takes ownership, they answer the question, I give them feedback, uh, and then they add some improvements in red. Again, similar kind of thing with the, the school uh, policy, and, and all of them that are linked to this have got access to it. Um, so given the feedback and then this was a live assessment. So if any of you are going to ask in the future to kind of give them live assessments, you can do these in the docs, which is pretty much like a word document. So we set them five questions to answer, uh, gave them a time limit. So they had an hour to answer the questions. Uh, we sent out um, a link to the resources. Uh, so about 10, 15 minutes before to give them a little bit of planning time. Um, and ultimately, uh, all they did then. So on the right hand side, again, you can see. Um, sort of all the time. So when they logged in, when they finished, um, all those sorts of things. So you can see that um, we shared it at that time. It took that long to do it. And, and you can kind of go through and load up old versions uh, and things like that. So it shows you exactly what they've done uh, and how they've responded to it. Uh, so that's me done. Uh, thank you all. And now I'm off. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, moving on to Alistair. Okay, good evening, everybody. 
So first of all, um, can I just say how wonderful it is to join you all the way over from Northern Ireland here. One of the wonderful things during lockdown has been the opportunity to access some of the most amazing CPD. I've looked over the RIT very often uh, with great jealousy of the things that are going on. So it's, it's great to be able to join with you. And I know that there are some people from Northern Ireland that are watching on here with me tonight as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm going to start off with uh, something a little bit cryptic here by not revealing the title for reasons that will become apparent in a moment because I want to start off by laying out a little bit of conceptual underpinning for this, two of the most important concepts that underpin a lot of what we do in geography are the concepts of space and place. And of course, as we all know, a place is space that has meaning with it. So if I showed you um, a place name like this, I'm sure if you were in the room with me right now, you'd be shouting out things like the Empire State Building, Macy's, Times Square, things like that. What about this place? Now, if you've never been there before, if you've never visited, then you're reliant on information about the city of Belfast being mediated to you by other sources. For me, it's where I grew up. It's my home. I have a very different sense of it than perhaps those of you who have never come over to visit. But I want to show you one last place in Northern Ireland. I'm going to invite you to see if you can wrap your tongues around how to pronounce that. Now, if you're trying to say Lisnagunogu, I'm afraid you're wrong. This is Lisnagunya. Now, before you slag us off too much about how we are going to have the most bizarre place names in Northern Ireland, if anybody's here from Loughborough, you cannot say a word. So what about Lisnagunya? It's a place that has probably no meaning to you at all. It's an entire space rather than place. But if any of you have visited the Causeway Coast, you've probably driven through it because it's a tiny little hamlet not too far away from the Giants Causeway, which of course is displaying behind me at the moment. So you might well have visited it without even realizing. So why am I starting with a reference to a tiny little hamlet in Northern Ireland when I'm going to be talking about GIS? Well, part of the reason is this. I, I just wonder whenever we are exploring case studies around the world, if our students, whenever we say things like hi Anne, have a similar experience to what you might have just had when I say listen again, you. In other words, there is absolutely no real meaningful sense of place about it. It remains this rather abstract space. Now, I think that can especially be the place. Oh, well, I should tell you, actually, let's reveal the title. Uh, Overcoming the Lisnagunya effect, using GIS to turn space into place. Um, the Northern Ireland GCSE specification asks us when we're looking at tropical storms simply to look at the impacts on people and impacts on buildings. Now, this is an extremely exam friendly way of presenting that information to them. It's bullet pointed down, it's got the facts and figures. If they were to repeat that, they would do extremely well in the exam. The only problem is it's absolutely awful geography because it, it is pretty much decontextualized and pretty much meaningless for them. So how can we give them a really good experience of geography? How can we turn the space into place? Well, we sequence this GIS activity uh, after we've covered some of the basic content with them. This is how they learn about um, tropical storms in the first instance. This is having learned about it, how they then apply it. And um, there's a little bit of uh, good old good old slides, Ryan. I, I was loving your last presentation. I've used them very similarly during lockdown. Uh, and I actually did this exercise that I'm about to show you here with our students, our year 10 students during lockdown. Very, very brave to let them have a go at this without me in the room to help them. Talking of being brave, I'm now going to try and live demo the software. Wish me luck. Here we go. Right, this is the software that I've made available to the students uh, and it really just guides them through. And I want you to see through this, I'll just give you a little bit of hint of this one, that we're gonna be looking at things like scale, we're gonna be looking at pattern distribution and I'll reference this scaffolded freedom down towards the end. But we start off by taking a look at the overview. You can look at them uh, where the tropical storms are likely to occur. And then you can set in these bookmarks, which takes them through and they can guide themselves through um, the presentation uh, and do the activities you want them to do with this. Now I can go over here and it gives me the key here about when the tropical storm becomes a typhoon. I can click on any of these little icons and information comes up. So we can get them to track the intensity growing of the hurricane or the typhoon as it moves across. 
then we can go in a little bit further again, uh, coming into the national scale at this stage, and we can turn on the satellite image of the typhoon itself. How big is this? Well, the measure tool here allows them to get a real sense of scale. They can move this around and gather some information and get a sense of this of being around about 16, 1700 kilometers across. But we can go in even further again because you can come in and take a really close look at the national scale of this. And then this is where they can start to access some of the real analytical tools uh, that the GIS offers for them. Because I can turn on this layer and there's the legend, the key again, which shows them the storm damage. And we can get them to explore some hypotheses. Hypothesis number one, as distance from the center of the storm increases, the amount of damage decreases. And you can definitely get them to explore that north-south pattern there. But you can take that further with them. They can look at an east-west pattern um, because you can link this into the general circulation of the atmosphere. Remember, you've looked at the global overview of where this is. The winds are approaching from the east here. And you can see that there's definitely an east-west pattern. You can link that through to uh, the fact that once it uh, makes landfall, the energy source of the oceans are significantly reduced and the amount of damage can be reduced again. We can come in very, very close now to this island uh, where the damage was greatest. And again, here is some more information, the storm surge. I'll just turn the other one off so that doesn't get in the way for us. There's the storm surge. Here's an opportunity for another hypothesis. Again, as distance from the center of the storm increases, the storm surge height decreases. And they can explore the extent to which this is true. They can get figures from this because any one of these is clickable and all the data is there. But this is where it starts to become really interesting, I think, because whenever you look at this, yes, it's true to a large extent, but look at these two up here. There's some anom anomalies now. I love anomalies. I love the fascination of places that seem to break the rules. What is going on there that makes this place unique? Now, because this is a GIS map, they can't just, uh, they don't just stop at examining this. They can genuinely explore it. You can go into that particular location and you can say, right, I wonder is the topography here something to do with it? The, the fact that this is a bay, perhaps the waves as they approach are funneled in and as they're funneled in, the height of the muscle up and maybe that explains why the height is so great here and it really unleashes this amazing ability for them to explore and talking of exploring on a small scale if you do this case study you will know that Tacloban city was particularly badly affected again we can take a look here at the uh, legend that tells us the buildings that are damaged and collapsed they can look at the pattern and then they can go into literally a street by street view Again, what I got them to do with this was use a measure tool and explore the relationship between distance from the sea and whether the buildings were damaged or completely collapsed. But I had a light bulb moment when I first did this last year, when we weren't in lockdown with some of my students. When one of them came to me and said, Mr. Hamill, is there a relationship between the size of the building and the damage? And do you know what? He was absolutely right. And do you know what's more? I hadn't even noticed when I was setting the task up. And this for me was a tremendous light bulb moment about how this is that scaffolded freedom that I talked about at the start, that there is a scaffolding, there's a support. They're not just a, having a free for all with this, you're guiding them through, but you're equipping them and enabling them to explore. Having given them the knowledge in the first place, they're able to explore hypotheses and they're able maybe to find out things that I, the teacher, didn't even notice myself. So there's the um, things that I was showing you the way through. Um, these, this presentation will be made available to you later. You can have a look at, through at some of my uh, longer reflections on that and linking it through to the notion of powerful geography and some of Maud's work and how that links through. So I finish off with giving you an offer and a challenge in how we overcome the list Nagunya effect. What if I were to make available to you the slides presentation that my students used in lockdown. What if that got you access to the GIS map plus all of the support plus the video assistance that I gave them? And what if you had a little bit of an explore? I wonder if you teach Haiyan as a case study. I wonder if you unleashed yourself into that GIS. Will you come out of that having a little bit more of a sense of place about that space? And if you end up with that, just imagine with me what your students will end up with and the opportunities that something like this presents to help them to turn Haiyan into a place. Thank you very much.
Brilliant. Thank you, Alistair. We're running slightly behind, but next up is Jenny Campbell. Okay, hopefully you're all able to see my screen there. Um, firstly, just thanks for, for having me on to speak. I'm really quite excited to kind of talk to you today about retrieval practice. I know that it is a massive, massive thing that lots and lots of people are talking about at the moment and um, lots of people are buying into it. And I don't claim to be the world's greatest expert, but um, I do have some things that I think I can kind of share with you, which hopefully will be um, wonderfully, uh, which hopefully can be something that you can take home from this. Um, I first got interested in retrieval practice a few years ago at school and what really interested me about it was actually a lot of the misconceptions that surrounded it. Um, a lot of people in my school actually thought that by using retrieval practice you were straight away kind of using metacognition, you were getting the students to think independently and they saw retrieval practice as a metacognitive technique whereas obviously it's not a metacognitive technique it, it's just a cognitive technique so I then started to explore how I could kind of use it in a more metacognitive way. Um, retrieval practice is quite simply just the act of recording information from the long-term memory without using any resources at all to help and for me it's it's got so many opportunities there as a teaching method so obviously as a teacher it's a wonderful opportunity to find out what pupils know um, as Katie kind of mentioned earlier it's a great way of activating prior knowledge and linking some of that prior knowledge together so you can kind of start to think systemically and synoptically um, but then I've really focused more recently on using it as an effective revision technique um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm so sick of students coming to me and telling me they don't know how to revise, their revision isn't effective, and it's all very well us using retrieval practice to help them revise in the classroom, but what I really, really wanted them to do is to actually be able to use it effectively and completely independently at home, at the point where they're generating their own resources, they're not having to rely on me giving them mind maps, they're not having to rely on me giving them um, kind of revision clocks and those kind of things. And I saw it as a really good opportunity for students to be able to understand their own strengths and weaknesses, as well as me understanding their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so some of these things that I'm going to show you, they are magpied from other people, but I just wanted to show you this is this has become my starter and I used it pretty much every single lesson for my current year 11s that have just uh, just left. And so they knew that when they got into the classroom, they would have six questions. There's a little bit of interleaving in there. So there's some questions from um, topics that they studied right at the start of year 10, some from um, topics that they studied at the end of year 10, um, and then some that they've just studied very, very recently. Um, so it's a great Great way of kind of getting them to revise sometimes they will link into things that we're discussing in the lesson sometimes they won't but for me it was a way of trying to make sure that actually my students were regularly revising throughout um throughout the whole year rather than just leaving it till the last minute and this is where the metacognition comes in so Obviously, with retrieval practice, it's a great way of, of checking their gaps and getting understanding what they know, what they don't know. But it's also a wonderful act of actually being able to embed that, um, that information into their long term memory. And what I wanted to start to get them to do is for them to understand how they can reflect on their progress, how they can build and develop their own resources through using this kind of planning, monitoring and evaluation cycle. And I actually conducted my master's um, in teaching studies on this. And one of the key findings that I found, which probably isn't surprising, is how crucial and how important modeling is in order to get this to work. And this is quite a long term process, but Honestly, the the kind of the response I had from the students, the impact it had on their learning it, it's been absolutely massive. And I would say it's had a major impact on my teaching as well. Um, this is just kind of indicating to you how I started to get them to um, think metacognitively. So at the end of conducting some sort of retrieval activity, they would always have to do some sort of evaluation. So they would need to think, OK, I've completed this from memory, we've gone through, we've given feedback, these are the areas that I now need to go and weigh and revise. And that's kind of how I started to get them to think a little bit more metacognitively. So in order for this to work, the students need to be used to re uh, uh, practicing retrieval practice in lessons, and they need to have already kind of started to understand the benefits of it. Um, so over the last six months to, to sort of a year, my year 11s have been completing regular revision, retrieval practice at home, as well as in class. 
And basically it's really simple. They develop their own eight to 10 question quiz based on a decided topic. They then answer the quiz themselves and they self-assess it. And they complete these quizzes once a week. And it was fantastic because I didn't have to do any marking on it. They did it all themselves and they knew every Friday they'd get the retrieval practice books out and I would have to come around and check that they had done it. Now, obviously, you can't expect them to be able to do this straight away. So I needed to model the metacognitive thought process in lessons. I needed to uh, model kind of how to develop the quizzes in lessons. So we started off designing these quizzes as a starter or a plenary in some of my lessons, showing examples to the students about the sort of questions they should be asking, brainstorming ideas together in lessons and all those kind of things just to make sure that they knew exactly the sorts of questions they should be asking. Because what I didn't want to do is just say to them, you've got to go and create a 10 question quiz on rivers, go away and do it yourself. And um, so we started the process off doing that. Um, and then basically what I said to the students is, you need to create the quiz, leave at least three days, then answer the quiz from memory and then use those notes and revision guides to actually um, then mark the quiz. And they can use the notes and revision guides to help them design the quiz as well. And then this bottom point is really, really important. The quizzes are a mixture of short answers, focusing on memory recall, as well as some more complex um, questions and answers, because there is a big misconception around retrieval, is it basically just being fact recall? And it's not. I'm doing a lot more research recently into kind of using it for higher order and synoptic thinking. But as you can see on this, um, this example, you can see there are some very, very quick questions for them to answer, but then there are some longer kind of slightly um, higher order thinking questions, for example, explaining how longshore drift works. That's, good, that's a process. They need to think about all stages in that. It's not just kind of a quick place name or a quick fact that they can recall from their memory. So it's getting them to start to use this both as a fact recall, but as higher order thinking as well. And then here is just some examples of some fantastic work from my students. Um, by the end of this, I wasn't even setting them the topic. They were identifying the topics themselves based on their weaknesses. They, they were given no class time to create and generate these quizzes. They went away, they did it themselves. And the feedback that I had, um, I couldn't include any of the quotes directly in this presentation because of, um, obviously anonymity and those kind of things, but it, they said it made them understand geography a lot more. It helped them to revise. They said it actually made them enjoy geography a lot more because it helped them to kind of link different concepts together. And like I said, this took a really long period of time and I had to embed it in the lessons first. But by the end of it, they weren't just doing the quizzes, they were mind mapping from memory themselves, they were generating their own revision clocks. A lot of them started talking to me about how they were doing it in other subjects as well. And I genuinely really believe it was one of the things that kind of really enhanced their ability um, to be good geographers, but also their ability in exams. And it meant that they were so much better at kind of drawing synoptic conclusions, thinking critically and bringing different ideas together because they had all this knowledge just readily available at their fingertips. Um, like I've said at the bottom, it is um, a culture. So it's something that, like I said, you need to build kind of um, very, very gradually. You can't expect them to do it straight away. Um, and I know one of the big questions that a lot of you might be thinking about is disengaged pupils. How do I know that pupils did this um, from memory? And it is something that I want to carry on looking into, but I know from my research that it does still help disengage pupils to a certain extent. Obviously there's a bit more of a cap, but it's something that I need to keep working on to make sure how we can kind of really engage them with the, with the retrieval practice and metacognition. Um, and that's it. So hopefully you found that useful. I know I went through that really, really quickly, but please feel free to get in touch with me on Twitter if you have any questions about that at all. I hope that was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Now we're on to Abdurrahman. Um, okay, hope this works. Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks to, to Jen and Paul for, for allowing me to speak today. It's, it's a pleasure speaking to all of you. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it on the first slide for a second, uh, not only so that you can appreciate my stab at humour here, uh, but also so I can talk to you a little bit about the um, the point of of what I'm talking about today. I think we've already talked about synoptic links and and making links between different parts of geography, but I think uh, making it all organic and genuine, and I'll speak about that in a second, is quite important. 
just a note on that picture i thought i was gonna be quite up there with the the technical sort of stuff today but then alistair came along and, and showed us all up with that gis masterclass. so i feel a bit silly now um but anyway um so why why do we do it um so first of all the word synopsis comes from um latin uh, from from the greek uh, of seeing together uh, and aside from in a second what i'll talk about here about it being good for exams and uh, exam performance really when you think about it, it makes for very good geography you know you'd struggle to teach certain things or or rather a student would, would struggle to uh, know a certain topic or really understand a certain concept or process without really having thought about something synoptically i.e how does this link to that um so jackson said in 2003 in, in quite a famous article thinking geographically offers a uniquely powerful way of seeing the world and making connections and geographers make sense of the world around them by seeing it through a lens you know what what they're seeing in our classroom is distinctly different uh, from what they might see uh, outside of it and we have to take pride in that we you know it's not just you know what's in the news it's uh, you know perhaps what's in the news but through the lens of geography uh, you know often often the phrase where's the geography gets bandied around quite a lot but i think uh, we need to engage a lot more with with what that means um so but obviously there is a link here to exams. So the AQA nine markers at A-level and the 20 markers are synoptic in nature. There's a little bit of a note here from an AQA document about how that plays in. And although I don't teach it, I know that uh, Edexcel paper three and OCR's component three have huge elements of, of synopticity. Uh, if you want this sort of uh, done in more in depth sort of view, then, then certainly have a look at what uh, what Ryan talked about. I've, I've left the, the link here. He, he certainly does a much better job of it than I do and, and actually focuses on it for key stage three which is uh, sort of rarely looked at. Um, so these are just some examples of, of questions. These are some 20 markers and some nine markers from AQA. And you can see I've highlighted um, themes across them. And, and this is just, uh, as, as some of you will know, evidence that there is uh, synopticity there. Now, if you look at the first question, it's not really necessary that, um, you know, I mean, certainly it's the word synoptic doesn't appear in the mark scheme for those of you who are aware of this question, but really, not knowing about the processes behind globalization will make sure that essentially you don't unlock any of the marks in this in this paper sorry in this in this question so it's important to to have a, a wide and holistic view of, of these things and you can see that in this these other ones as well i mean this one down here makes it even the most obvious so to what extent are environmental problems a consequence of globalization so how do I do this? Now, what I want to make clear before I jump into this is that although these might seem like sort of three standard activities uh, and they, they can they can seem quite sort of tick boxy, like if someone asks you, what do you do about in geography, we think, well, I get them to read an article here and there, or I chuck some cards at them uh, and then they do it, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you've got to make sure that the way you're doing it in, in your intentions, I mean, is quite organic and genuine. You don't want any of this taking away from what you're teaching. In fact, it should supplement what you're teaching. So uh, this template here, which will be available in that on that Google Drive link you can see at the bottom, is something that I've started to use recently with with year 12s, uh, and, and I'm hoping to, to push it for year 11s and, uh, and, and perhaps year 10s as well. And the way it works is that you sort of put the article in the middle, uh, the students uh, have a title for each paragraph, but more importantly, they look through these geographical lenses, which you can see there at the bottom. Um, you know, I'll show you an in-depth example here in a second. Uh, one thing that you've got to be very aware of is that the articles that students pick, although I'm sure you'd love to give them all the freedom in the world, you've got to be wary sometimes of the things that they pick. You know, there is such a thing sometimes as making an tenuous link i know we'd all love as geographers to think you know geography is in everything but there are some things where you think hold on a second that's that's a bit too far um so you've got to be wary of that you know one week i gave a very specific list and then the next week i didn't and then i got some very very tenuous links uh you know attempts to link the cycling patterns to all sorts of things and and you know it wasn't it wasn't good geography um so this is how i sort of went about it this is me doing it uh, this is an example i gave to the kids so please don't uh, tear it apart too much because this is my best attempt and also try not to focus on my absolutely horrific um handwriting because my kids give me enough uh, stick about that already uh, but the main from this is that I've not got a perfect approach to this you know I put out a question as to what people would add in terms of geographical lenses and I got some good ideas which I've added um, but but really my point here is that if you look at this and you think there's um, you know a theme a lens which you think should be included and, and is relevant to geography um, then please let me know I've tried to be here as sort of 
um, comprehensive as possible, you know, not to scare the kids and to think, oh, God, do I have to do all of them? Uh, I'm going to end up with a multicolored bit of paper that might not be useful. That's that's not the case. You know, I uh, I think we I could potentially do every single word on here. Uh, but I think sometimes we know the the importance of prioritizing certain things. And so long as we tell the kids that um, they'll they'll jump on that, too. So, like I said, if you've got any thoughts on, on additional lenses or better lenses, uh, then please do let me know. Uh, the other thing was was about speaking. And this is the one where really um, you, you do try and get it as organic as possible. The, the aim of this is, is, and these are based on the subject specific vocabulary um, given to us by AQA, that they try and use at least two or three of these cards in the lesson. Now, the important thing is, and, and how I explain it to the kids more, most importantly, because they can get a little bit sort of like jokey about it and really try and force in the word management or political, whatever, is that it should enrich the lesson or enrich the discussion, both verbal and written, as opposed to distracting from it. And that's one thing I'd caution if you do want to try this idea that it can it can take away from it. Uh, and, you know, but so long as pupils are using them properly, it helps. I think sometimes they might try and squirm out of it. Uh, but I remember one time we were struggling to use the word management in a lesson. Um, uh, and the thought of me saying, look, we're not going to go to break until we do it, suddenly made them actually see the geography a lot more clearly. So uh, sometimes all it takes is a bit of an incentive. Um, the rationale is that if the students are using these words and it becomes sort of part of their everyday uh, uh, sort of lexicon, that, that they will end up using these naturally. You know, I, you know, I think as much as we'd love to think that um, people live and breathe geography, it's often the case that they don't. So we have to sort of, quote unquote, force them in, into doing that uh, in a nice way so that they, they use words like patterns and political and management without even meaning to or without even thinking, which is which is ideal. Um, and it's also very helpful in getting the students to see the bigger picture. You know, I looked at this bit of the OCR spec and I thought, how else could you teach that, about, which is about rebranding of places without thinking about the, the ideas that it's sort of inextricably linked to identity, globalization and, and sustainability. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and the final one is, is mapping. Now, I want to talk this. I'll show a slide at the end. Oh, sorry. Do I need to wrap it up, Jen? No. Sorry, no, I was on mute. I didn't realise. Um, oh. Last but by no means least is Joe Payne. Sorry, just sharing. Here we go. Okay, right, hopefully that's ready. Yeah, here I am, the graveyard shift. Um, everyone's all incredibly uh, well this evening. So many uh, topics covered and ideas to take away. But I'm going to finish up with um, the idea of using booklets to teach geography. Um, so as you said, I'm Joe Payne. I'm at underscore Joe Payne. I'm head of geography in my current school, but I'm moving to a new map from September. But I'm also the curriculum um, community leader for geography across the seven schools in the or secondary schools in our map. Um, so, you know, with that comes responsibility to really look at curriculum, look at geography curriculum across the school uh, and see how we can develop it further. So I feel like I might have missold you slightly by saying using booklets to teach because this is something I'm developing at the moment. So it might be more appropriate to say making booklets to teach. Um, but I have been using the last sort of month or two to start putting this together ahead of um, September. Um, now, before I just look at the booklets with you, I'm just going to look a little bit at the sort of preamble of this. Um, and as a mat, I've been involved in this curriculum project for the last sort of 12, 18 months, I suppose. Um, and we've talked a lot about this uh, idea Joe, you're on mute. Am I, was I on mute the whole time? Do we need to go back? Uh, 10 seconds. 10 seconds, that's all right. I didn't put myself on mute, so I'm not sure how. Okay, um, yeah, so I'll say again, we, um, we went back, um, we had a closer look anyway, principles, curriculum design, and this idea of three stages, uh, where we have an intended curriculum. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. 
but we're really honing in on the implemented curriculum. And by that, we mean the PowerPoints that we make, the lesson plans we design, um, the booklets that people have been creating. That's our implemented curriculum. Um, but what we've been discussing as a trust is that actually, we want to move people more into the side of an enacted curriculum. So what do people do within the classroom that transforms that implemented curriculum into something that our students can access? So how do we enact that uh, and put it into practice? And that tends to be what we don't spend as much time doing because we spend a lot more time thinking about the resource itself. So we're thinking really about that enacted curriculum. Now, including um, this particular um, tweet from uh, Reach, Out, um, uh, Reach Academy Feltham um, curriculum, uh, probably I would imagine that John um, Hutchinson tweeted this out at the time, but I've watched a lot of teachers over the last uh, few months in particular designing workbooks, largely around, uh, around the idea of students completing it and filling it in. Um, and when I saw this particular tweet um, in which they've reflected on their curriculum over the last sort of couple of years, I suppose, and saying that they've listened to feedback and are proposing that students write an exercise book. So the resource becomes more like a textbook. I felt like this is something that I could get more on board with. Um, I've liked the workbooks, but I've just worried that perhaps it doesn't allow for the depth of writing an extension for our most able students. So I felt like this design was something that I could uh, perhaps work with a little bit more. Um, and that brings us on to uh, the booklets that I've got since. So over the last couple of months, we've been working on uh, this design with biomes in particular. I'm still keeping going with weather and climate change and superpowers. Um, but looking at um, the actual content, I'm going to go to content, I'll come back to assessment. So the content themselves, as you can see, they're very typically um, textbook in design. Um, and they contain all of the core knowledge that's required. So our substantive subject knowledge that's required uh, to teach this. There's nothing controversial in it. I don't think any teacher is going to be uh, debating the structure of the rainforest anytime soon. Um, so all teachers are gonna agree this is important geography and um, it's really a good stepping stone into key stage four as well. So these are our key stage three books and this is year seven. Um, but we've also considered how um, we how we factor in the assessment side of it too so we've kind of started with the end in mind of saying well actually this is um the assessment the way it looks we're thinking about some of the skills around this as well and i have maps using the aqa spec um the skills across key stage three to ensure that they've at least been taught once uh, before students enter key stage four um so they step up in, co uh, in complexity finishing with more of the explain style question um, but all of the content that's needed to access the assessment is indeed uh, within the assessment, um, in the, sorry, in the workbook that you have, or in the booklet, I should say. So within this, there's also activities that teachers can use with students in the class, but equally they don't have to. They could be using the content of the lesson and thinking about that enacted curriculum and saying, well, actually, that's the content of the booklet. How am I going to use this? Um, and that could be then used in a myriad of different ways. So the activities are there to support colleagues if they need it, um, but ultimately they could be quite creative with it themselves. Alongside those workbooks, we also have simple PowerPoints. Um, and by simple PowerPoints, I really mean this in two different ways. Uh, they're simple in design. So thinking about principles about, you know, taking away that extraneous load um, and not having PowerPoints that are too busy in their presentation. So they have that simplicity to them, uh, but at the same time also have a simplicity for teachers to be able to adapt them as they want to. So to be able to add more in if needed um, and, uh, and add their own notes to it, I suppose. Um, you'll also notice that some of the principles of sort of modelling that's already been mentioned this evening, retrieval practice has already been mentioned this evening, um, but those filter into those PowerPoints to support the delivery of the booklet content as well. Now, of course, the greatest um, concern, I suppose, for people and for teachers um, is that does this take away some of that teacher autonomy and that teacher creativity? And that's something that I've really thought hard about in terms of putting these booklets together um, and how we overcome that, I suppose. And, you know, we're here tonight because we're professionals who are engaged in um, our professional development um, and we are a, a community largely on, on Twitter and we share ideas all the time. But at the same time, we also have to you know, realise that that isn't the case for, for all geography teachers. They might not have that same level of engagement for lots of different reasons. 
Um, and what the booklets do, and the PowerPoints, I suppose, to a certain extent, they had they guarantee a consistency of curriculum and student experience, um, because then it more becomes about the pedagogy behind it and what teachers do with that. So with the implemented curriculum in place, then the focus becomes on teachers' pedagogy and how they deliver that in the classroom. Um, you know, we have a situation at the moment where we have NQTs. I mean, I've had a cohort of geography trainees that have just finished with us who obviously didn't have a second placement. Uh, so they are going to enter September in a different way to previous trainees. In the same sense, you know, non-specialist teaching, there's a tweet about that recently and lots of uh, fantastic suggestions about how you manage that. But hopefully this curriculum goes some way towards supporting colleagues there as well. Um, the booklets contain eight lessons of core substantive knowledge. Um, in a cycle, cycle one for us will last um, for 15 lessons. So that's eight lessons of core knowledge, but that's also, what, seven lessons, quick maths at this time of the night, um, but that also means we've got seven lessons that we can do other things with um, and can filter in some of that creativity in the classroom as well. I thought about it in light of a seven year curriculum. Um, so uh, I'm working, I'm moving into an 11 to 16 map, but I've taught A-level for 15 years. Um, so in year nine, as you saw from the front covers of the booklets just now, superpowers is our topic. So that filters down the edXL A-level uh, and some of the core knowledge into, into year nine. Um, Within that um, seven year curriculum, it was quite interesting. Today, um, I joined the Teaching School Southwest Summer Conference and Christine Council was talking and I mean, she was amazing. Her insight into curriculum was phenomenal. Um, but she was talking about how, and I have to look at my notes because it's such a fantastic uh, phrase. I don't want to miss it. Um, and she, yeah, the phrase that she used was how the key stage three needs to wash through to key stage four. And I thought that just really struck a chord because I am a bit concerned that I'm repeating topics at key stage three. Um, and a bit like Katie was mentioned at the beginning, like, does it feel like they're just doing it time and time again, or does it genuinely build each time? Um, but I liked that phrase of the key stage three washing through to the key stage four. And it's helped me to think about my curriculum in a more kind of genuine way, I suppose. Um, the booklets are designed the way they are. They are based on educational research. If we think about Rosenshine's principles of instruction. And again, today I listened to Professor Kirshner talking and he was saying that actually Rosenshine's, it covers all of the cognitive science that's gone before it. Um, so it's a, a fantastic document to base a lot of our curriculum design on. Um, the curriculum, as you see, has been implemented and the focus for geography teachers is now the enactment of that curriculum. And that's where I think the series um, of how I teach, um, which I think it was Tom Heinert that started that, um, Ben Ransom as well, uh, has contributed to that. And I think that's really valuable for teachers as we see how we deliver some of these key geographical ideas. Um, the booklets are designed to have high challenge within them, um, but they allow for dif uh, differentiation. And by that, I mean, you know, I have been that teacher and I probably still am sometimes where you're planning the night before you've got so engrossed in the resourcing and you've made a fantastic resource, but you've not given yourself the time to really think about the needs of children within the class who can experience that lesson. Um, so the booklet really means that you're, there's your implemented curriculum, but then how are you planning to deliver that in the classroom? Um, and teachers can still include those enriching activities, um, you know, David mentioned Mark earlier, so if we go back to, you know, the angel cake for your cave arch stack and stunt, if it's something you desperately have a desire to do, it can still fit within the cycle because you have um, those additional lessons that are outside of that core knowledge within the booklet. More recently, I've been thinking as well about this idea of beautiful work um, from Mary Meyer, I think originally, but where Kate and Rachel from tonight as well um, talked about that at Seneca at the Teach Me. And that's really made me think about students really exploring some of these ideas in depth um, and, and engaging in producing um, an outcome piece of work that isn't just the assessment where it is a bit more structured on preparation, perhaps for key stage four. So having room for that beautiful work uh, within the curriculum, I think is still really important. Um, so hopefully that covers where and how uh, booklets fit into our geography curriculum. Um, but as I said, I'm at underscore J Payne. So please uh, send me a tweet if you want to find any more um, about what we've been doing. Thank you. And I'll pass you back to Joe. Uh, sorry, to Joe. I'm Joe. I'll pass you back to Jen. I think we're going to pass over to Paul, actually, uh, to finish off. Okay, um, thank you so much everyone for tuning in this evening. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. 
um, who took the time out of their evening to speak to everyone tonight. And thank you for everyone who voted for such amazing speakers. Um, we have one jog chat next week coming up hosted by Josh Sutheran, um, who launched the Prime Geography Initiative at the Seneca CPD. So he's going to be talking about how we're going to bridge that gap between primary and secondary ge geography education next week. Um, a special thank you to Jen for the organization of this event tonight and for Dave Rogers for all the support that he's given um, to get this up and running. And thank you again to um, all our speakers tonight. And hopefully everyone will continue that conversation over on Twitter now. So um, have a good evening, everyone.